Hello again, welcome to GM Tips. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, the co-creator of Maze Arcana and GM of Savage Nation. GM Tips is a video series where my friends and I share our thoughts and suggestions on how to game master or dungeon master your role-playing game. In the first episode, we discuss how to find your gaming style. Utilizing the previous GM Tips, you've already started running and playtesting your game and are feeling pretty confident about GMing. Until, Another Game Master sits at your table, ready to play. This episode's theme is Both Sides of the GM Screen. Today we have Eric Campbell, the Director of Development for Geek and & Sundry and GM of Eric's TBD RPG, to discuss game mastering and playing in someone else's game after you've become a GM yourself. It's already pretty scary running your first games, but GMing for other game masters, that can get pretty nerve wracking. You wanna get every rule right, which makes you forget more rules. You accidentally ask for the wrong skill to skill check. You fluster, then you realize you're flustering, wondering if you're, you're boring them or being too complicated or not complicated enough. The pressure's on because you wanna impress them or outthink them. <laughs> well, guess what? You've just taken yourself out of the moment and are so busy overthinking things that your fears come to life. If you don't know a rule or a stat, it's okay to ask the other people at the table for help. They have the experience to know that you're all playing together for a common goal. Fun. The reality is that once Game Master leaves their GM screen, they're just another human being. When they sit down at your table, they're a player, not a GM. Your table, your house rules. What you have is a player who knows more rules than your other players at the table. This can be helpful if you both discuss them helping you ahead of time. It can be distracting if you haven't. And this goes into what we bring up in most episodes. Pre-game house rule explanation. You have to let the players know what you expect at your table. If you're gonna bend the rules, make sure you tell everyone before you play or the rules lawyers are gonna come out. Just like normal players, you'll have easy gems at your table and you'll have difficult gems at your table. If you set your boundaries, you'll be less likely to get pushed around like some of the more controlling GM slash players might do. Don't let them take over your table. This happens sometimes where your players might stop asking you for info and turn directly to the other GMs. Let the other GMs at the table know to refer player questions back to you as you're the game master. And don't let this scare you. Setting boundaries is a good lesson for life in general. In a nutshell, behind the screen tips. Set boundaries and table rules before the game starts. The GM at your table is now a player, and use the pre-established rules to counter the pushy GMs at your table. Now let's talk about the other side of the GM screen. Game master as a player tip, don't be that guy. All right, you've been GMing for a long time and you are so excited to play in a game. You've written a five page backstory that you can't wait for the GM to read and weave into the game, only to find out midway through the game Everyone else wants to play dungeon diving murder hobos. Role playing isn't the main agenda of the evening and you better have brought your calculator or you're gonna get left in the dust. Okay, so the game master didn't set the rules for the table ahead of time. Well, that's not how you would do it. No one's speaking in their character's accent. Again, not the way you would do it. You wanna tell everyone they're doing it wrong, stand up, epic table flip and walk out. <laughs> Well, hands down, that is not good etiquette. As a GM who's playing at a table, you have to respect the acting GM's play style and rule set and respect the players around you. Appreciate the time they're all taking out to be there with you. And as a GM at the table, some might look to you for guidance or how to act at the table. So be a good role model. If you're playing with your friends rather than telling everyone you do it differently and like it when XYZ is done like one, two, three, Try remembering that it's a game. And just play with your friends. You're not always gonna sit at a table that's exactly what you dream of. Mostly because no one's as good as your first GM, but you're there to have a fun experience and so is everyone else. I could roll on about all this, but instead let's talk to Eric about what it's like being on both sides of the GM screen. Hi, Eric. Oh, <laughs> it's magic. I'm here. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What are mm. the different kinds of GMs you find at your table? 
I've been lucky that I haven't had too many extreme cases. Um, I do, uh, I think everyone has an encounter with the rules lawyer GM and the narrative style GM. There is definitely those two sort of GMs in existence. If you've got a rules lawyer styled DM and as a player and you're a narrative style DM, what I've noticed is that there can be sometimes a disconnect because for example, as a narrative DM, sometimes I'll, I'll tweak the rules a little bit. I'll run into of course the rules layer going, no dude, page 93 says this, like, and they've based their entire character on the rule of law. Every now and then you'll get that sort of like, and then they'll get quiet at the table. And just be like, fine, yeah, fine. What do and you do? What I usually do is I'll meet them halfway. Mm -hmm. So if, if it looks like it's a problem or if, or, or if that player's like getting irritated, then what I'll do is I'll switch to diplomacy mode. All right, well, let me fit my narrative to fit your text. But when it comes to stuff like that, honestly, it, it's not that difficult to, to tailor and sort of meet because the, the game starts with the rules. So it's not, it's not hard to sort of pull back. And, and I think if you show that you're willing to meet them halfway and find that middle ground, they'll be cool about it. Like in the end, it'll be totally fine and it'll work out. Because narrative and, and rules, they're supposed to marry together. So it's just as much my responsibility as a narrative storyteller to meet that GM player as it is for them to meet me. So yeah, it's pretty easy. Explain a little bit about the experiences that you've had with Easy Game Masters to play with. I'll use my most recent experience because uh, for the very first time ever on my show, TBD RPG, I, I was running uh, Doctor Who and Matt, uh, Matt and I have known each other for a, a, a long while, a good chunk of time now. And like, that's a game master player who you can set loose and will totally play within the boundaries established as you're the storyteller, he's the player now. And you can totally see that that's, that's where he gets off playing NPCs in Critical Role. And in this case, he got to do it as a player. So it was really, when you run into an easy Game Master run to run for, it's somebody who plays that, that sort of selfless, um, just in it for the fun, like gets to, gets to, to, to storytell for themselves, but also continues to contribute to, to the story itself. That's always the best. I'm guessing the next question is what's a difficult <laughs> what's a difficult game master? Yes. So difficult I mean, I've been fortunate. I haven't actually run into too many difficult game masters because when it comes to when it comes to sitting down with a group and playing, what I've noticed is that eventually everyone will find a conformity. Like everyone will find uh, everyone finds their pack. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they will acclimate to the pack. So even if you're a game master, what I've noticed is even if it's somebody who you're anticipating being kind of stringent they would, what I've noticed is they would be, it would take them like a good 30 or 40 minutes of like role playing with everybody and trying out the rules and then they would just adapt and then everything would be fine. So I'm, I'm lucky because I personally haven't had any negative experiences with other game masters. The, the few times that it's happened with me, like I said, I haven't had any negative experiences because they all ended up okay. But I, but I mean, there, that doesn't mean I haven't had experiences at the gaming table that started getting negative. And they always happened in games that were not quite as rules based. They were always very narrative based. So like exalted by White Wolf or any, and pretty much any of the storyteller styled games where things are a little more theater of the mind, a little more free formed. Like there was this one GM that I played with who was a brilliant GM, he was very visual, but as a player, he, he was a little out of control. Like he, he knew the rules so well, way better than the rest of the players. And he could play a character that was underpowered and hog the spotlight from everybody. Yeah. and sort of dominate, and he would like dominate the rules and stuff like that. At the time, I wasn't experienced enough to know how to handle that, so it just became this really kind of negative gaming experience at, as a player, because I was a player in the group with him as a player. I wasn't running the game at mm -hmm. the time. Um, but as a GM, when I was running him and I ran into that problem, it was simply a matter of taking him aside and, and I, was, I was real positive about it. I was just like, you know, you're a vet and you're playing with people who aren't a vet, so I need you to help support the group. Ah, good. It's like, guys, I need your help. I need you to help me run this game, essentially. And so, and, and that, like, oh yeah, I can do that. And suddenly became a, he became like a support role and everything was cool after Almost that. Almost like you're making him an NPC. Like, okay, you're a player, <clears throat> But yeah. you're also helping me with all of this too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't because it was like, how, how can I put this? It's essentially like you're the president and they lost the election. <laughs> <laughs> and so instead of creating an enemy, you say, uh, I want you to be my second in command. Look, I know you're a GM. And instead of just delegating you to like, no, sit there and be a player, it's like, okay, you can be a player and here's how we can use your strengths as a narrator. Help me support the rest of the group. And then that way it's kind of like, even though there's, a, there's, there's established roles of GM and, and players, it's, it's still a collaborative effort from start to finish. Yeah. Like I set the stage, as they say in writing or screenwriting, it's like, 
when you write a script, you, you're building the skeleton and then your actors are applying the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same thing with, with running a game, I find. Are there pitfalls of being a GM playing in a game? Like, do you find yourself judging a little bit? A little or? bit. The, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, there's no doubt in my mind that <laughs> occasionally as a GM when you're in a game, there's, there are those moments where you have to get your ego to shut the hell up. <laughs> I remember I was on a, on a panel with, with Ivan Van Norman and we were sitting there talking about like our different GM styles. And I, Ivan, no one will dispute that Ivan's a brilliant storyteller and, 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 and like we just have different GM styles. I, I don't even remember exactly what was being said, but I do remember like we were being very respectful and cool with each other because Ivan's like a really good friend, but we were getting kind of heated like, no, this is how you GM. No, this is how you GM. And so I was just, it reminded me of all the times I've been a player and I've let that ego kind of been like, it's not how I would have done it. <laughs> like kind of there's a little bit but the thing is is I've discovered that as a GM if you can just shut that voice up and allow yourself to say okay well no it doesn't matter how I would have done it these are my circumstances now so let's play in those circumstances it's like learning a dance routine like you learn the routine and then you release into the routine and you find the freedom in the routine it's just like any art it's like so, a book exactly like you're reading someone else's book yeah not the book that you've written exactly so you kind of just have to sit and enjoy it if you can do that you'll enjoy every game you play every game you play you'll find a way to enjoy it you just got to get out of your own way and that's the whole purpose of play to begin with what does your pre-game house rule explanation look like what, I, what I've noticed is that it, it, it's varied from game to game. It'll depend on what game I'm running with. Reg like, for example, one of my all-time favorite RPGs is Legend of the Five Rings. It's feudal Japan set in like a fantasy setting. I always compare it to what if James Clavell's Shogun met Game of Thrones. <laughs> nice. And so they get intimidated. Like, I don't know how to play a samurai. Like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And I'm like, guys, it's okay. I'll set it up so players will know that it's going to be a serious game. What is the most memorable DM moment that you've had? <laughs> it was a moment that got us, uh, my entire gaming table got teary-eyed. I was running them through the Battle of the Gauntlet, the adventure module for the new Fantasy Flight Star Wars Age of Rebellion. And they were in the final stages of battle where they were retreating and they're in the hangar. They're trying to hold the line as much as they can while the rest of the rebels are retreating. They had an NPC that they loved. And so as they're pulling back, they watched that stormtrooper gun down their favorite NPC. Oh, no. So they were sitting there and they're trying to do triage on him. My friend Eve, she rolled her medicine check and the fantasy flight dice, the way they work is, is like, they're not necessarily success fail, it's success how you succeeded, the advantages and whatnot. And what they ended up doing is they ended up rolling a failure with a bunch of advantages. So I ruled, okay, you can stabilize him, he won't die, but if you move him, he will die. The party had to make the call. So Dallas pulls two grenades and he puts them on his chest and the NPC clutched them. And everyone was like staring at each other like, oh, are we doing this? And he's weakly saying, go, go, go. Oh. And Eve is like, no, I'm not gonna, no, 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 we're not doing this. And Dallas grabbed her and dragged away and he's just telling, go, go, go. And he flipped the grenade tops. And as they're moaning, like Eve is screaming and reaching back and the detonation, it sets off like a chain reaction. It blows up one of the speeders that's next to them. This, the whole hangar like lights up. And by the end of that game session, like there was dead silence. That's really intense. And so all, and what was great about that is when the game came to an end and they're sitting there quietly on this transport, clutching their rifles, no one's saying a word. It became clear like, oh my God, the rebellion's a real thing. That and it was beautiful. But yeah, as we were folding up the game screen, we were just like, I was like, oh, and you're like, holy ah, shit. Success. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I was, yeah, there was a part of me that's like, I don't know if I want to do that again. Like, you kind of can't. Like, that kind of, that moment, that's a singular I, it's moment. It's weird because I'm mourning an NPC that I just came up with, but the way he went out, it was, it was like, that was an incredible moment for our group. We, we as a group, that, that game took us to another level. Quick tip to the audience. So never, never, ever lose sight of the fact that even though y'all are all adults or whatever age you are, and you're sitting at the game table and everyone's got character sheets in front of them, don't ever allow yourself to lose fact, lose sight of the fact that you're all on the playground right now. We're on the playground. You're on the playground. Like, just play. Like, you owe it to yourself, for God's sake. Just, <laughs> just play. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on. That <laughs> was welcome. really cool. Thanks. <laughs> you're you're welcome. wonderful. Ah, yeah, thanks for sharing your brain with us. Yes, thanks for having me on. Yeah. That was fun.
That's our show for today. A big thank you to our special guest, Eric Campbell. You can see him on Eric's TBD RPG, Fridays from 12 to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, here on Geek and Sundry's Twitch channel, and follow him on Twitter at 16BitEric. I hope you guys enjoyed our GM tips. I look forward to sharing more tips with you here on Geek and Sundry. In the meantime, you can find me every Sunday on twitch.tv slash mazearcana from 12 to 4 p.m. Pacific. Thanks for watching. Eric, GM us out of here. Sure. Roll a d20. 13, okay. So you feel like a cold sensation on the tip of your nose, just like a weight. You're not sure exactly what it is, and then all of a sudden you become aware that you can f you can hear your own breath, like it's really close, almost like it's cupped in your hands. And that's when you wake up and realize this entire episode was a dream and you fell asleep with the player guy on your face. <laughs> <laughs>